All right, friends and neighbors, welcome back to another networking video. This time, we're going to talk about subnetworks, super networks, and route aggregation. Now, this is sort of a follow on. We've done a collection of, of videos on uh, subnetting, and I also did one on aggregation, but we're going to do a little bit more here. So, we're going to provide some background, we're going to do some examples, and then we're going to go through sort of a tough homework assignment that I've given my, uh, my students and talk through some of the issues there. So without further ado, let's get started. So let's get our definition of a network straightened out here. We know that a network is really a layer three sort of construct. And when we think of a network, we think of all the hosts on that network having the same IP address. So when you're on a network, uh, that means you also have the same broadcast address and the same network ID. So for example, uh, 192.168.1.0 .1 and 1.255 would be the network IDs and the broadcasts. And then usually you have the same router on there. That's not always the case, but typically you would have the same router. Now, one of the things about a network is that also all of those hosts can all see each other's MAC addresses. So that means that you can ARP for them, you can build frames directly to them, and the rule, of course, is that the minute somebody's not on your node, you can't get their MAC address anymore. We almost never know the MAC address of a node that's not on our network. Now, there are lots and lots of reasons that we break up a network. We might break up a network because it's just simply too large. We might break up a network for security reasons or because they're specialized nodes, because we want access to resources, servers, things like that. So there's lots of reasons to break up address space. So a lot of times we chop up a network into subnets. But that also means that those subnets at some point, at least in routing tables, have to be aggregated back together. We don't want to have our routing tables grow really large just because we went and chopped up our address space. So uh, that's kind of our, our basis for getting started here. Subnetting is sort of the, the root of all of this, right? The basis for a lot of what we talk about in network can be found in these mystical, magical doctrines called RFCs. If you go back far enough, people have thought about most of the things that we've been thinking about today. Uh, the, the issues associated with subnetting and supernetting, best practices and everything else, have been put into these documents from 20, 30, 40 years ago. RFCs 940 and 950 are two examples of this. So We'll just go through this real quick. You know, RFC 940 toward an internet standard scheme for subnetting. Hey, how about that? And then 950 is the subnetting standard procedure. And the basic idea is that there's lots of reasons that we break things up. And this is where we see the terms subnets and sub gateways or gateways being used in conjunction with breaking up this address space. Well, so that was 1985. So if we jump to 1989, remember that RFCs 1122 and 1123, I've got them here. That's where we get our idea of how the TCP IP model is put together. So we have requirements for internet hosts. That's our standard protocol suites that we're used to dealing with. IP, ICMP, IGMP, ARP. And then of course, we've got TCP and UDP at layer four. Along with that, is the operation of all the protocols and what hosts were supposed to do when they used the common protocols in use at the time these RFCs were written. So this means DNS, DHCP, our login, Telnet, FTP, SMTP, TFTP, I mean all of these. Now there's a couple of really interesting statements that come in all of these. I mean the, the writers were sometimes well, a little tongue-in-cheek, sometimes they were having a little bit of fun, but sometimes they were just trying to give you good advice. And so in RFC 1123, we see something called the robustness principle, which says be liberal in what you accept and be conservative in what you send. And that was just being a good net citizen, right? What you're trying to do is preserve the network. Don't put a bunch of garbage out there. Don't put too much stuff out there, but be willing to accept connection. They also said that protocols and software for that matter, at least in the networking sphere, were supposed to be designed for every conceivable error. I don't know if that's really pop possible, but there you have it. That's right in the RFC. And we know that address space is limited. Certainly, we've had lots of discussions about IP version 6. Uh, and this is an indication that very early on in the process, they were aware, right? So RFC 1338, 
1529 and 4632, they're all following on this idea of classless addressing. So that's sort of the sequence. So we just got through with 1985, 1989, now we're in 1992, and they're already talking about better ways to split up the address space. And so 4632 is just the latest version in that series. It obsoletes the previous versions. And it discusses the strategy for the um, address assignment in the existing IP version 4 address space. And the whole point was to conserve address space because the class structure during straight class A, B, and C, very wasteful in terms of address space, particularly when we start talking about um, class Bs. And this was for reasons that we'll talk about later on. This is because if you had a network that was a little bit bigger than a class C, you had to be given an entire class B, which is much, much larger and way over capacity. Uh, the last RFC there was also an update as to how well the techniques did in controlling address space use. Now, when we get to RFC 4632 uh, and we see the further discussion, we find out that there are two major goals here. These are really clearly stated in 1519, but the idea was aggregation along topological lines. And that's a key word and tricky phrase. When you are aggregating things, it's really tempting to aggregate or assign addresses sort of how they make sense to you. But the topological concern is that when you are following the routed pathways, you've got to make sure that those spaces, those networks, can actually be aggregated together, not just in terms of numerics, but also in terms of how the traffic will actually flow. There are some problems that are created in topologies where you try to aggregate. Uh, Multi-homing and new service provider renumbering are, are two of them. Those are right in the RFC. You can take a look at those. But the, the basic idea is that you've got these aggregated connections that may be changing or more than one way to get there. And that, that creates a problem for aggregation. Now, another big part of that was the distributed assignment of network space. And so the way that addresses are typically allocated, we know that, you know, they come down from IANA and then we've got the regional internet registries and then the regional internet registries hand those out to ISPs. And then the ISPs actually control the chopping up of the address space. And that becomes really, really important ad idea for us. So that an ISP can actually assign you the size of the address space that you need or the properly sized address space not just simply a classful address. All right, so a little more detail on the problems. So the, the thing that was obvious early on was the class C, class B uh, network space problem. There just aren't very many uh, networks out there that are class A, right? There just aren't very many of them. There are, you know, several thousand class Bs, and then there are millions of class Cs. But the problem is that as more and more people joined the networks or as networks that joined were small or in between sizes, that created this problem that they're talking about here. Class C with a max of 256 possible host addresses minus two for the network and the, and the, the broadcast ID was too small. Uh, whereas a class B, which allows 65,000 is too large for more organizations, but would be the best fit. So if you had a thousand hosts, well, we can't just give you four class C's. We're going to be, give you a class B. So that doesn't really fit the problem. The other really big issue is that for core internet routers, the size of the routing tables without aggregation was going to be enormous. It's not uncommon at all to see uh, internet routing tables that exceed 100,000 routes. In fact, some of the, some of the core routers are, are beyond uh, half a million routes. And that's a lot of processing for a router to do. Even early on, and by early on, right, we started talking about 1985. And so this is 1993 and 1995. This is a quote right out of the, the RFC. It was clear that the then rates of Internet growth would cause the first two problems to become critical sometime between 1993 and 1995. So there you go. So we've got this problem with the Class B and Class C address space and the size of the routing tables. And that's really the issue for CIDR. But even with some of the fixes, things weren't exactly perfect. Um, here we have RFC 1878, which obsoletes 1860. 
about variable length subnetting for IP version 4. And so this came along about 1995. And the problem was that everybody was trying to figure out how to use variable length subnets and trying to create subnets. When I first started networking, there was a rule that you never, ever, ever use the lowest subnet in the range and never use the high one. The reason for that is because the low subnet in the range has the same address as the class full address space, and the high subnet in the range has the same broadcast address as the broadcast directed at the class full address space. So nobody wanted to use those. Well, it wasn't too long before routers got smarter, and this particular RFC not only provides some tables that shows you how to um, do the subnetting, but also officially obsoletes the practice of excluding the all zeros and all ones subnets. Well, we're all about fun here on this networking channel, so if you wanted to have a little bit of fun with it, RFC 2050 is kind of related here uh, because it's the guidelines for how all of these uh, all of these organizations and, and entities are sort of structured together. By the way, um, it was official several years ago that we were out of address space. If you want to read uh, the notes on it or the, the release, there you have it. Montevideo, uh, 3rd February 2011. The number resource organizations, the NRO, announced today that the free pool of available IP version 4 addresses is now fully depleted. So there you go. Well, thanks very much for watching. Thanks for listening. Um, next up, we'll do a little review. We'll do a, subnetting, a quick subnetting problem and then do an aggregation example. And then we'll talk about some of the things to watch out for. As always, folks, thanks for watching and may your packets always reach their destinations.